Welcome to another episode of the Alongside Podcast, a podcast of Heritage Baptist Church. The purpose of this podcast is to come alongside fellow followers of Christ in order to have a thoughtful conversation about the gospel, culture, and the church. I'm your host, Mike Crump, and today I welcome our executive pastor here at Heritage, Pastor Kent Gregory. Kent, welcome once again to the Alongside Podcast. Thank you. So good to be here. Now, it probably makes you feel really good, but... uh, our highest ranking podcast is the last one you did um, with that other guy. That's because um, it was with our senior pastor, <laughs> yes. <laughs> so that uh, one about the uh, Pathway to Family Discipleship, uh, really yes. well received. A lot of people thankful for that and um, very excited about the Pathway. We're not Excellent. here to talk about that. but uh, No, I figure after this podcast, we'll have the highest listened to podcast and the lowest listened to <laughs> podcast. <laughs> well, they hit both sides of the spectrum. There you go. That's great. That is great. So in this, uh, in this podcast, we want to talk to you about your life, about your entrance into ministry, and uh, what the Lord is doing even currently. So let's start in the past. Um, tell us a little bit about where you grew up and your church background and how you came to know Christ. Sure, sure. Um, yeah, it's a privilege to share uh, background, a privilege to share that I came to Christ at a young age. I uh, grew up in a Christian home. My dad and mom have always been in ministry uh, my entire life, so grew up or was born in uh, central Illinois and um, my first five years spent there then we moved and my dad took a church in Long Island New York so a little culture shock nice yeah going from farmland to New York uh, <laughs> Long Island just very populated obviously uh, mm-hmm. busy hectic and then uh, as the high school years rolled in uh, my sophomore year my dad took a ministry position as a an area missionary with Word of Life Fellowship and we moved to Maine okay so culture shock wow. number three yeah. so uh, yeah we went to uh, Farmland, city, busy life to um, woodlands. I woodlands. guess yes. Uh, what what was say. the hardest transition in all in all those? I think one of the most challenging things is my uh, going into my sophomore year. There was my first entry into even public school. Mm-hmm. I'd been in Christian school ever uh, my whole life. Yeah, and then double that with I was now a missionary kid. Ah, uh, yes. So you come in with multiple labels. Mm-hmm. Um, The other thing was uh, my brother was just a year older than me, so uh, he had hit his growth spurt and was about 6'1", 6'2". I think I was 5'4", both vertically and horizontally (laughs) about that time. So (laughs) it was a challenging challenging year. I feel Um, that. I feel that very much. Yes, and went from from a small or I went from a a thriving youth group Mm -hmm. on Long Island and uh, a Christian school where I felt very comfortable yep. and um, then went to, went to a, a very, very small church, small youth group, um, not a lot of believers in the school that I went to and stuff. So tough transitional year, weird, awkward time of life yep. anyway for me. And um, it, really, it really challenged a lot of things mm-hmm. for sure. So how did how did you come to know Christ? How how did he draw him to, or draw you to himself? Sure, sure. Um, heard the gospel my whole life, yeah. um, and uh, saw it lived out in my parents' life. I'm very thankful for their example. Um, the the way they lived did not make me question the truth of God's word. Yeah. They they were not perfect by any means, but they also they lived out what they believed, mm. and so I was very thankful that I didn't have to wrestle with that. Um, made a profession as a youngster, but didn't really recall. And I remember it was when I was 10 years old, New Year's Eve night, um, watching one of the old Christian movies on a New Year's Eve service. Yeah. And I mean, that's when cinema, Christian cinema was at its finest. At, at its peak, yes. Yes, in the early 80s. <laughs> um, the name of the movie could have been a cheesy Christian mu- movie. I'm not sure. Yeah, but yeah. Whatever that was, it tried as best as possible, even in this, to to depict dying without Christ. Mm. And I don't remember the name of it, the yeah. theme, the direction. I just remember sitting there going, I am not sure I'm secure wow. in my salvation. I, I do not know if I were to die what my eternal destiny would be. I knew all the answers in my head. Um, I just did not ever re- recall a time that it was mine personally yeah. and if you want to say in my you know the phrase in my heart but it, it, I didn't embrace it that's a better way to put it I didn't I didn't accept the reality of that for my life yeah um, so after the service um, I didn't go forward at that moment my dad gave a presentation and all of that and I don't know why I stood up and I went all the way and I sat in the front row it was oh, the weirdest really? thing yes and I, it really was pride or it was um, everybody thought I was the good Christian, yep, safe yep. kid already, the pastor's son. And interesting enough, um, my future mother-in-law, 
they attended our church really? at the time. My mother-in-law told my mom, she goes, I think Kent went forward, and I think you need to talk to him. Hmm. And my mom came up to me afterwards and said, did you go forward, or did you just feel the need to walk 30 feet and sit down <laughs> and in the front row? Yes. Seat, yeah. um, and I said, no, I'm just so confused, uncertain. And my mom took me back to my dad's office. Um, that's where I usually got spanked yeah. when my mom <laughs> took me there. But at this moment, um, it was just an opportunity where she walked me again through the Romans Road. And I probably could have quoted the Romans Road back to her at that yeah. time. Yeah. But that's when it became a reality mm. for me. Huh, not perfectly lived out ever since, but it really became a reality where I look back at that point and I say, that's where... I embraced the message of Jesus Christ dying for me, a sinner that had no way at all to um, basically bridge that gap to God. Yeah. Because, because the sin in my life and the holiness of God and Jesus Christ came and he paid that price. And that, that's, that's where I look back as the night to where I'll say the Holy Spirit allowed it to click, mm -hmm. drew me, mm -hmm. um, and, and I accepted uh, Jesus Christ and committed my life to him. That is so exciting. Yes. You know, I, and what it, what it goes to show is that... Um, the Lord can use any means Absolutely. to draw us to himself, yes. whether it, in your case, maybe a cheesy movie. Yes, uh, for it me, <laughs> it was a, a cheesy drama on the stage, you know, being done by a bunch of teens. Yes. Um, the Lord can use so many things to draw us to himself. Yes. And so that's just an awesome story. Um, thank you for sharing. Yeah. So from that point, um, you're young. You have finally trusted fully in Christ, applied that to your life. Um, what's next for little uh, Kim? <laughs> um, what's next was the next couple of years were there in Long Island. My dad started another church in Long Island, and just there was times of uh, a thriving youth group and getting in, involved in a Word of Life club, which yeah. is youth group, and there was scripture memory, and there was quiet time, and there was, there, there was a time of growth. Mm. Um, you know, so through that, and then at the end of my ninth grade year, we moved up to Maine, yeah. as, as I mentioned, and it was a time to where... Um, wrestling through even how do I how do I want to live this out or do I want to be known as the missionary kid Christian kid mm -hmm. all of those things and wrestling through that and I and I really unfortunately chose my own desires those three years for the most part yeah for the most part yeah um, I chose sports that was my avenue to connect with people gotcha and um, through sports and doing relatively well in those in high school, that opened up, you know, the, uh, the, the friends, yep. you know, the, the, even the popularity, for lack of a better word, through that and opened up girlfriends. And, you know, it was just living for me. Yep. That's all it was. Yep. And selfishly, um, you know, and looking back, uh, I, I regret those three years probably more than any other period of time in my life. Mm. Um, for the consequences of sin, um, that are that are not just brief. Yeah, they 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 last over long decades. Yeah, and then also for the regret of um, missed opportunities mm. to share my faith mm. and to know those people I called good friends. Yeah, I didn't really share the gospel with. Wow. Um, I had moments where I talked of things of God. I had moments of living out things of integrity or living out some things like that that made them question things or maybe ask. But uh, the, the daily was not, um, you know, a, a proclamation of Christ by yeah. any means. Yeah. Yep. And so going from those moments, and, and um, th those are always difficult years, I think, for, for most of us. Sure. Um, because there is a lot of tension. You're trying to figure out identity, all those kind of things. What led you from Maine to Lynchburg? Sure. How did you make that transition? Um, well, uh, the, the brief story is Liberty University. Okay, all right. But, you know, from Maine, went to Word of Life Bible Institute okay. for a year, and that's really where um, God really did a work mm. and um, was a very uncomfortable season in my life. <laughs> um, living, living that double yeah. life, yeah. for lack of a better word, is challenging mm -hmm. and uh, convicting and hard. And um, so it was, it was that whole first semester where I still tried to be – all about what I wanted. I went to the Bible Institute simply because I, I was a good boy mm -hmm. and I knew my parents wanted me to do that. I didn't have a great college plan anyway. Yeah. And so I was like, ah, sure, they got a basketball team. I'll go up there and play and do ministry through that, mm -hmm. whatever is involved. Mm -hmm. I can I can fake that till you make it. Um, and um, so I went up there to play basketball and to enjoy that year and God really convicted me and, mm. and it was a brutal first semester. I came home, made many things right, some relation, a relationship I was in, um, many other issues made right mm. over that Christmas break 
And really, that was kind of the turning point of um, desiring to live for Christ, although yeah. I was still at a point where I did not want to sacrifice my future to him. I wanted to go into business, wanted to make money. Gotcha. Wanted to do, um, I had seen kind of from a ministry side of things and the missionary side of things that money's not exactly flowing. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I enjoyed uh, material things. Yeah. So my focus was start a business or, okay. or get into business and, and make money. Yeah. And that was my direction and goal, even... Uh, have a business degree from Liberty, okay. and um, after the Bible Institute, went to Liberty, and was was on that track until until uh, kind of an event in the future that really changed things. Okay, so along along this path, where where does where does Tara come into the picture? Because <laughs> that's where I, you know we got hinted at. Yes, uh, Tara and my wife met in third grade Sunday school in my dad's church on Long Island. So wonderful story of God even orchestrating. Um, my in laws and my parents are bar- are best friends. That's awesome. And it is. I, I don't really have the full uh, horror stories of in-laws and things like that by any means. And yeah. it's such a blessing. Uh, I consider, you know, it's like I got my mom and dad and so blessed by them. And I really consider my in-laws like kind of a second set of parents. Yeah. Uh, so we've been ridiculously blessed with them in our lives. So Tara and I met in third grade. As much as you can like each other in junior high, we did. <laughs> whatever that looks like. Whatever that is. I strongly do not recommend that yeah. now. You know, things like that. Um, especially my kids were of that age. And um, we ended up, she went to the Bible Institute as well. Okay. We ended up, um, we kind of, when I went to Maine, we, our, our, our like, our relationship, mm-hmm. whatever it was at that point, I mean, it was deep love, of you course. know, in ninth grade. Of but um, we, we, we separated ways through high school, but got back together that second semester okay. at Word of Life. And then after our sophomore year in college, we got married. That's awesome. Yeah. All right. Yes, just and celebrated 30 years last week. That's amazing. Congratulations on Thank that. You. Uh, Thank that you. That is an exciting it's, thing to see. It's more of a blessing to her. <laughs> she, many crowns for her. Well many, done, many crowns, Tara. Yes. We're very, very happy for you that you <laughs> you can endure so patiently. Yes, that is the key. <laughs> so how did you get into ministry? You, you, you want to go into business. You're excited about making money. When does that turn happen? Sure. Um, I, I would say my pursuit of business was still running from God. Okay. I even really felt through junior high, first couple of, uh, first year of high school, um, I really felt, if you want to say a call to ministry, a longing to ministry, that God had placed something on my heart, whatever you want to define yeah. that as or yeah. how you want to define that, and had been given the opportunities to do some um, through a, kind of a youth group competition thing. You know, I won't go into the details of that, but to do actually some little preaching, uh, yeah. preacher boy things at seventh, eighth grade, and and singing and serving. And hey, my dad was he started a pastor or he started a church as a pastor. So um, my brother and I were the janitors and the helpers, yeah. and we set out the hymn books and we picked them all up and we loaded them up and we cleaned the floor and we did whatever was yeah. needed. Uh, we were staff and. Um, and I just saw the importance of my dad worked so hard, mm-hmm. faithful to the Lord through all that stuff. My mom too, but you know, you look at your as your dad there, and you realize how much it meant. And my dad consistent was talking about, hey, whatever you're at, whatever you do in life, whatever your occupation is, you, you're there also to serve the Lord. Amen. You're there to serve. Yeah. You're there to serve. So it was ingrained in us, ingrained yeah. into um, into both my brain from my my parents and Tara as well. Yeah. So we get married and we looked, all right, now where are we going to go to church? And in the same sentence, where are we going to serve? Mm. It was just, yeah. it's what you do. They go together. Yep. They, they go together. Um, that, that is what God has equipped and wired us to do, is to use the gifts he's given us. Uh, given us excuse me. So we, um, a month after marriage, we attended Heritage because they had Word of Life clubs, which okay. we're familiar with. Yep. I needed a Christian service at Liberty. There you go. The youth pastor here said, hey, we'll use you in youth ministry. And I was like, done. You're great. Love it. We love the teaching. We liked, um, we showed up late the very first Sunday. Somebody gave us wrong directions. <laughs> we met a great uh, young couple that took us into a marrieds class and connected. And it was the church, the only church we visited as a married couple. Oh, really? And wow. we are here now. 30 years later. That's and, amazing. Um, so, yeah, it's been an incredible ride. But getting back to that serving aspect of it, we were from month one, literally, after our marriage, mm-hmm. we were serving on a Wednesday night. And then we were in the youth group. And then we were small group leaders. And then we were driving to camp and involved in every aspect of ministry. And I was doing some teaching and some lessons. Mm-hmm. And 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 uh, even though in my pursuit of business, I worked in business, um, worked in life insurance, et cetera. Then I started my own painting business for okay. two years. And through even that, through that whole process, um, I, I knew deep down I was still 
denying what God wanted me to do. Yeah. And uh, in growing in our service here, um, actually my, my dipping my toe into the water of ministry um, came as a result of, of a moral failure of our previous uh, youth pastor. And I basically talked to our senior pastor and I said, hey, um, I will put my business on hold for a year if, if you and the deacons feel like um, you want me to come in and um, and serve as an interim yeah. for a year until until you find a real youth pastor. That was that was the proposal. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that, that's that's deep. No charts, no PowerPoint, no, no anything. Yeah. <laughs> and um, so we met, we talked. Long story, which I will not bore yeah. anyone else through. But um, when my daughter was four days old, we we basically came on as uh, or I came on as the interim youth, youth pastor. pastor. Wow. Yes, that's exciting. And yes. so, how old are you at this time? How old am I? Yeah, how old were you at that time? <laughs> oh, that time. At that time, um, not this time. I know you're like really old. But. I am. T- I, that was it. I was 26. Okay. I was 26. Just turned 50 last week. Okay. Or two weeks ago. Wow. Yep. So you're coming on. You're stepping into obviously a difficult situation, but yes. something that uh, you feel the Lord has equipped you or pulled you into, kind of called you into at least. I think. In the interim. I, yeah, I might might clarify one thing. I didn't feel equipped. Okay. Um, I thank the Lord still that I was naive enough to step into that position <laughs> in obedience. Yeah. I really do. Yeah. I think if I'd have known all of the um, repercussions of, of the damage mm. of sin that impacts not only those leaders that we're serving, that damage those young people, those mm. teens, um, yeah, you would, I, would have, I would maybe would have done a double take. Yeah. And, um, but I went in, and, and again, I thank the Lord for the naivety that he gave me and the burden that he laid on my heart too. Mm. Um, I knew it. I knew enough that it was going to be challenging. Mm-hmm. That would almost be an impossible situation for someone coming in fresh without any familiarity to the kids. Gotcha. Yeah. And so that was one of the reasons I really felt the Lord um, pulling me or or challenging me to. And, and Tara and I, it was a huge step of faith at that yeah. time. And um, you know, for Tara, obviously as well, uh, literally a newborn, mm-hmm. four days old, and. Here's the security of the job to take. Um, we'll just say it wasn't quite as much as I was making in my business. <laughs> okay, so you have that whole security thing, oh, yeah. right? And yeah. young family, and what are we going to do? And it's just been unbelievable to see God bless over the years. Mm-hmm. And um, but in thinking through that, that naivety, um, but the blessing of the longevity of ministry, yeah. even of those helpers that were helping at that time. Yeah, we had three or four couples that were already serving, already in there, and had been in there five, seven, ten years oh, wow. at that time. I'll, I'll just say between five and seven years yeah. at that time. And they were godly couples that I looked up to that at that time, probably in their 40s, mm. serving in youth ministry, connecting with young people, living out, not perfectly again, but living out that life as, an, a, model, as a model, as an example. Mm. And those were the type of people that helped bridge the gap of, awesome. of even uh, reliability of these students yep. that look and say, say, yes, one person failed, and can we trust that person or mm-hmm. anything they told, told us? And you had the wisdom and the guidance of these more mature, faithful, reliable leaders that were like, if what was said was the truth of God's word, you can always count on that, even if people don't live it out. Amen. And I'll never forget that statement and response yep. um, to the teens when they asked that question, and so much truth in that. Amen. Amen. So one of the things that we noticed in coming into Heritage um, seven years ago, roughly seven years ago, um, was the longevity of ministry, and specifically yes. in the youth area. Um, and so you were in the youth area as a youth pastor for many years before you made the j- transition. Um, and that's not very common. No. Um, when you look at youth pastors, usually it's it's a stair step to senior pastor, or it's just a phase as you know go through ministry yes um, but you were in there for a, a long time and what is it about youth ministry that just really kind of drew you in sure yeah my wife and I we served as volunteers for a little over six years and then and then I was the youth pastor um, had that interim year mm-hmm. and then I just tell people they the staff really got lazy and forgot to fire me and look for another guy <laughs> is really what happened but uh, had the absolute privilege of serving as youth pastor for 22 years Wow and um, so considered myself kind of a dinosaur um, the average length of stay nationwide for youth pastors is somewhere around 14 months at a church wow. 
um, which is sad. It is. Um, it really, really, truly sad. But one of the one of the joys, just loved it. Incredibly challenging, um, difficult. Love to see the, um, just really love to see the students' growth. Mm-hmm. And um, I, I say that students are, are they're just fantastic at sensing out hypocrisy. Oh, yeah. Um, or they're the greatest lie detectors ever. You know, so, <laughs> and, and I love that about their honesty and sometimes their brutal honesty um, about the questions of their faith, yep. um, about the challenges of life, about the challenges of maybe how parents are living that is causing them to question what then the parents are saying about spiritual things. Mm. You know, so you had to process this and wrestle through this. And I love to see... Uh, young people be challenged with the deep truths of God's word. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it was, and, and I believe our church is this: is we are we are never uh, we don't preach fluff on Sunday mornings in the main service, mm-hmm. um, and we try to equip children with the truth of God's word. And I, as youth pastor, and and thank the Lord for Pastor Nathan yep. Fox right now, who teaches the deep truths of God's word to our young people yep. and challenge them with it and the the practical things. I look and I'm I'm not. Uh, super educated and and all that. I'm I'm just very practical and try to take the truth of God's word, make it very practical and real before the students. And I'd love to see how uh, a lot of them embrace that, grew, and um, I'd love to see how so many of them have continued their walk with the Lord Mm -hmm. over all these years. And obviously over 20 plus years of ministry, you have seen a lot of (laughs) students come through and even grow into adults, even, and those who stay around, you see their own families start and. Well, it was, it was a joy. The last, I think, three years that I served as youth pastor, um, we had the children of some of the teens that came through our youth ministry start in youth ministry. Wow. So it was kind of a second generation type thing beginning. And so that was really, that was really encouraging. That was really fun. Um, to see, you know, my dad instilled in into me a long time ago, mm-hmm. um, and I forgot the quote he got this from, but he said, "But you, you, you never start. You don't start truly ministering until you baptize the babies of the babies you baptize." And basically, <laughs> he's talking about generational. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So it's basically the ministry is long term. Mm. Um, you know, to just to just sweep in or breeze in and give a great sermon or you know throw enough pizza parties to build the crowd and then and then bail or leave what have you done yeah what you know but to to let let people faithfully see your life see your marriage see you raise your kids Mm -hmm. see you live out the truth of god's word um again not perfectly but um faithfully yeah right and so we're trying you know in doing that and seeing that and then and then, and then hearing from the young people, hey, when you did this, it meant a lot. It really changed my life. Or thank you for being faithful in that. Or when, or even at times in some of the sad ones of, hey, even when my own parents were struggling and I couldn't go to them, I knew I could always go to you and Tower. And th- wow. it's just things like that. Yeah. Um, that that you don't get those every day by any means. But yeah. you, God was gracious enough to give those to us, certainly even when we needed them, to keep us going. Yeah. Yeah. The yeah. steady plotting of, of ministry, that, yes. that sowing and that that reaping and that just um, just continuance in ministry in one place, I, I think it is a lost art in many ways yes. because we're always looking for the, the bigger, better thing. Um, and so I'm so thankful for that here at Heritage, both in yourself and I think of you and Pastor Keith, who just or, you sure. know, just celebrated 35 years of ministry yes. just here at Heritage. Um, and so it's just wonderful to see men of faith for long-term periods here at the church. Now, your, your role has changed. Yes. Uh, you have transitioned from a youth pastor into executive pastor. Yes. Um, and how has that changed? Because that's kind of a, <laughs> a bit of a different role. Well, that's a loaded question, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, that, this has been a something I never saw myself yeah. in. Um, I, I, I joked that um, I never had the maturity level to be anything but a youth pastor but uh you know in processing through this it is it has been challenging it's been um it's been really neat again i keep saying god's been gracious and he has Mm. it's been it's been unbelievable that god has been gracious enough to myself to tara and myself over these last it's been about two years and a month Mm -hmm. since that transition to to see the things that god has gifted and and wired me in Mm -hmm that it can be used at this level yeah. or can be used in this role. Maybe I'll put it that way. Yeah. That's a much better way of saying it. In in this specific role, um, the, the pastoral um, even experience, yeah. um, uh, the, the compassion for people, the relational side of it, um, I, I really feel that 
uh, that God has, has wired me to teach mm-hmm. and to be able to use my the teaching um, and what he's instilled in me, that passion to to teach God's word practically mm-hmm. now, even much more beyond just in, to the teens, mm-hmm. which I still have the opportunity to do at times, which is awesome. Um, but then also to some of our discipleship communities at times, um, spoke at our men's conference mm-hmm. this last year. And um, so there, there's been a lot of other opportunities to be able to do that and see how God has been able to use those in, in different ways. Yeah. Well, God continues to use that gift, uh, and uh, we're very thankful for it um, here at the church. And I know that it's a it's a big role. There's a lot of moving pieces mm-hmm. that uh, I think many times people don't necessarily know about or yep. see. Um, and so, to that end, how can people be praying for you as the executive pastor here? At oh, thank you for asking. That. And and I'll just share, and I and I hope I can do it briefly. But this this role from youth pastor to even uh, executive. Um, I was approached concerning whether I'd be open to that role, mm-hmm. and I initially said no. <laughs> that, I, that I was like, uh, yeah, no. Anyway, um, but we went to Israel like two about two and a half years yeah. ago, and there in Israel was really just a, a, a time where I can look back spe- specifically. We were we were having communion at the Garden Tomb, yeah, yeah. and just it's a very powerful time being over there in Israel. And we had just gone through this whole process of looking out over the Kidron Brook. Mm-hmm. And this is how Jesus, you know, when the guards came to take him that night out of the garden, this is the path they would have taken. And, and all of the, and, and for the first time seeing it, mm-hmm. literally seeing, seeing the landscape, seeing all those things. And it's just rolling through my head. And then we're taking communion at the garden tomb. And I, I just, I literally, I was sitting there and I just had my hands just open, wide open. And literally the the price that Christ paid mm. and he he did it out of obedience to his father yeah to what the will of the father right yeah. he said not my, not my will but yours father right and and I just could not get past that phrase and so I, I literally during this communion time sitting there I've got my sunglasses on we're outside and I'm literally crying and Tara keeps like what's the matter I'm like I can't talk right now <laughs> and uh and literally but I was just sitting there and I just remember this and this this is a, this is a long answer to yeah. a prayer request no, no was I, I at that moment just committed to the Lord and just said, God, my hands are open. Mm. This, this would not be my will, my desire. But if the leadership of the church, um, if deacons and, you know, but, but if, if Pastor Nathan approaches this issue again, I will say that I am open to it mm. out of obedience to you, not seeking it, but just out of obedience. Yeah. And so that really if you want to say turn the corner and mm-hmm. and then I was in this role just a couple um, months after that gotcha. so the request would be that that my hands stay open mm. and and so I had to give that background a little bit to yeah. that because yeah. it's uncertain I don't know everything that this role entails and uh, quite honestly there's some things in it based on my personality or the people pleaser within me and stuff mm-hmm. that that makes it very challenging and can make it very difficult and um, um, and it, it's new, so yeah. I was in a good 22-year rut, or, or not a rut, but, you know, in a You in knew a good, what to expect. I knew what you, to you expect. The, yeah. I knew what to yeah. expect. And when you know what to expect a lot of times and, and you can get comfortable mm-hmm. or you can feel, um, hey, I, I'm either doing this well, but yeah. Lord, help me keep stay humble through the, all of this as well. Um, but in this, I'm like, uh, the insecurity levels are off the charts at mm-hmm. times, to be quite honest. So to have that open hand of obedience and know that God is not going to— um, put me in things yeah. and and put uh, that intentionally I, I would say he's not going to put me in things that are that are going to cause me to fail mm-hmm. um and and he knows how I'm wired he knows how I'm gifted he knows my abilities my giftedness and my reliance upon him needs to be uh, that's the other prayer request reliance on the Lord open hands and obedience and um, just faithful to his word amen amen well for those who are listening I would encourage you be in prayer for Pastor Kent's um, there is a lot that uh, he carries and is a great blessing to the staff and to the body here at Heritage. And uh, so just be praying for those things as he was sharing. Um, right now, we're going to move on to our final question, oh, which, again, I know you're very <laughs> excited about. Um, that is our uh, deck of random questions here. I have one more prayer request. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, hopefully we got to an easy one for you, oh, you know. All um, right. Okay, so <laughs> let's see. <clears throat> Um, no, I don't think that one will work. All right. Um, oh, here we go. This should be fun. Oh, that sounds that sounds um, great. Which words or phrases do you most overuse? 
I know you, you like to share about the phrases that you're tired of hearing. I do. I've heard I've heard some yes. of those. Yes. Which ones do you often overuse? I use the phrase in other words. Okay. A lot. A lot. <laughs> <laughs> Too much. <laughs> um, and basically. Uh, and probably people will go back and now listen to this podcast. Yeah. Like, <laughs> like, how many times did he say that? Man, he's and right. You know how I and uh, I my wife is such a blessing, but yeah. this is how I know some of those phrases that I use too much yeah. is because she lets me know afterwards in an encouragement, constructive criticism yeah. kind of way. So does she take notes and like you said this thirty two times? Well, I don't know if she <laughs> says the exact number. She probably would just say too many. Too many. <laughs> <laughs> but it's so helpful because sometimes we can get stuck on phrases. Oh, or yeah. Oh, it's very word, easy to do. word fillers and um or basically yeah. or in other words in other yes. words yeah no it's very easy to do that yes. i think we all do it if we would just uh, think back through that um and so yeah well thank you for being so honest and transparent there for for that moment there ken really Excellent. It. <laughs> thank well you. this has been another episode of the alongside podcast very thankful for pastor kent gregory coming on for more details on alongside including show notes past episodes and more you can visit alongsidepodcast.com i'm your host mike crumb thanks for listening and we hope that you'll join us next time as we continue to come alongside other followers of christ in order to have thoughtful conversations about the gospel culture and the church <laughs>